This first section then asks the question, why do we need HPLC? And it's all to do with analytical chemistry. So analytical chemistry is the science of chemical substances present in a sample. And we can chemically analyse pretty well anything in the world around us. And just a, a straw poll of typical applications um, from the almost infinite number of applications that we see in analytical chemistry would be something like measuring a drug in a tablet, vitamins in blood, sports doping in urine, nutrients in food, colours in paint, pollution in air, composition of plastic and contamination in water. The first aspect of analytical chemistry that we have is something called qualitative analysis and that's where we ask what. What is present? Is that substance that we think is there, is it there? We're really just concerned with if something is or isn't there and what substance that might be. So if we apply that to a list of applications then, if we look at the drug and tablet, we're looking to see what drug is present. Have we added the correct drug during our manufacture? Our vitamins in blood, we're looking to see what vitamins are actually present. Sports doping in urine, what substances are there? Is there anything there that shouldn't be there? Nutrients in food, what nutrients are present? And there can be any number of thousands of different substances in food that we're interested in measuring. Colours in paint, um, have we added the correct substances to get the colour that we want? Pollution in air, what pollutants are present in a rare sample and again there can be thousands of substances that we're interested in measuring as potential pollutants. The composition of plastic or polymers, what polymers and monomers are present and that we can apply that to pretty well any manufactured product will be extensively analysed um, using some form of analytical chemistry. Contamination in water, what contaminating substances are present in the sample, again there can be thousands and thousands of different substances. The second aspect is something called quantitative analysis. How much of those substances are present in our sample? So if we apply that to our example list, drug and tablet, we've checked qualitatively what drug's present, the correct one's there. Quantitatively, we're looking, is the tablet the right strength? How much of that material's present? Vitamins and blood, what levels of each vitamin are present, sports doping in urine, are any of the substances present in the sample above the legal limit, nutrients in food, what amounts of each nutrient are present, are the right amounts present for the type of food that we produced, the colours in paint, are the substances there in the correct ratios, pollution in air, we've looked at what pollutants are there, we're then measuring quantitatively is there anything there at harmful levels that we should be worried about? Composition of plastics. Is the polymerization process complete? What's the ratio of monomers to polymers? How much of the accelerants and things like that are left present after the reaction? And contamination in water. We've identified qualitatively what compounds are there. Quantitatively, we want to know how much, what levels of each substance is there and are they above any limits that we should be um, paying attention to that would mean that we would have to then do something about the sample from the environment. Everything that we analyse will be in some kind of mixture and that can be a, a complex mixture, something like blood or uh, food or environmental samples or it can be something on paper that's very very simple, a very pure substance. Our substance of interest will always be present with other compounds, other substances. And even very pure substances usually contain very small amounts of impurities and quite often we want to measure the amount of the impurities and look at what impurities are there. Any other substance that we have in the mixture with our target analyte, the substance we're interested in, has the potential to interfere with results. And from a qualitative point of view, we can get a false positive. And that means that the substance is not present, but our method tells us wrongly that there is a substance there. So if you can think about uh, a sports doping, our test has told us that somebody has been taking, say, 
amphetamines when actually it's the analysis that's wrong the person hasn't been taking amphetamines and it's our test is flawed and it's giving us the wrong results that's a false positive false negative is the opposite of that where the substance is present in the sample so again if we look at the sports doping somebody has been taking something they shouldn't be taking but when we perform the test it's not performing correctly and it doesn't pick up that substance that's present in the urine and that would be a false negative. From a quantitative point of view we can get results that are much higher than they should be, much lower than they should be or they can be very variable. We have a big enough job to deal with substances that are present in the mixture for our samples, what we certainly don't want to do is to introduce additional substances via any reagents that we use to actually do the analysis. And this is where water starts to become very important and we're going to look at that through the remainder of the training today. The higher the number or the greater the amount of our other interfering compounds, then the much greater the risk of interference. So if we then apply this to our table and look at what potential interference would be present in each of the applications that we've considered, the drug and tablet, um, the other substances that are likely to be there will be things like excipients and degradants. Anyone, any one of these can interfere with the results we get for our main target analyte. Vitamins and blood, there are thousands of other substances in blood. Again, any one of them can cause an interference. Urine samples for sports doping, any biological sample usually has hundreds if not thousands of other substances, very, very complex mixtures. Food, again, a very complex mixture. There are thousands of other substances present in almost any food sample. Colours and paint, it's not just the colours that are going to be in there, there's going to be all sorts of other substances to actually form the paint mixture itself. And the colours might actually be there in relatively small amounts. Pollution in air, there will be lots and lots of other substances in there other than just the particular pollutants that we're interested in measuring. Composition of plastic, again, we might be just looking at the polymers and the monomers, but there will be many, many other substances in there. There'll be colorants, there'll be accelerants, there'll be all sorts of things in there, all of which have the potential to cause interference. And certainly contamination in water, if it's things like river water or slurry, something like that, our analyte, we're looking at very, very small amounts of potential um, contaminating compounds, but there'll be thousands of other substances there at much, much higher levels than the substances we're interested in. We need a way of analysing a sample that actually separates our target analyte out from all the other potential interference that is present, and these are things called separation techniques. And for accurate qualitative and quantitative analysis, we need to be able to separate the mixture out and ideally isolate the compound that we're interested in measuring. HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography, is a very, very high performing separation technique. And we analyse our substances in the liquid phase. It's very high resolution, it has the ability to separate out lots of substances of very, very similar chemistries. And it's also very, very sensitive. We can detect, in many cases, at least nanogram per mil concentrations of our analyte.